I'm Marcus Smith, and this is the Constant Wonder Podcast. Our fundamental aim is to feature encounters with awe and people who experience awe, all because of our belief that awe or wonder is a real thing and of vital importance in our lives. On our last episode, we traveled around the globe visiting some of the world's death festivals. You may know about Mexico's Day of the Dead, for instance, but there are several other festivals where participants dance and sing not just about the dead, but with the dead. If you missed episode 28 of Constant Wonder Season 2, be sure to check it out on your favorite podcast platform. I promise it's not as creepy as it sounds. Not actually creepy at all, according to our last guest. Here's the thing, though. There are so many facets to celebrating death, if that's how you're thinking about it, or to mourning a loss, to conveying grief. And as we were researching death festivals, we got to thinking about what to wear. I mean, what we wear to funerals, how we dress the dead, even how the casket is lined, if there is a casket. And we wanted to follow up more specifically on this business of funerary fabric. So we sat down with Victoria Finley. Finley is author of Fabric, the Hidden History of the Material World. In that book, among other fascinating topics, she examines the place of fabric in mourning, and, well, not just cloth, because, as you're about to see, our conversation began with fly fishing rods. I have been to many, many funerals in my lifetime because I'm a musician, and I've been asked on multiple occasions to either play the organ or to accompany a choir or the singers, uh, soloists, what have you, I would estimate well over 200 funerals that I have been to. So I, I feel comfortable in that kind of a context. But I remember one funeral in particular that I went to. A young man, Vincent was his name. He was 14, had a heart condition that took his life. And as I walked past the open casket, I saw the satin fabric, and adjacent to his body were his fly fishing rod and his baseball cap, uh, a softball, uh, the, the artifacts of his youth. And as I looked at that, I, this has been 40-plus years ago, I still remember uh, thinking that satin, that satin, it's doing something to that fishing rod. It's making that fishing rod really important. Does any of that make sense to you? Well, it completely does, Marcus. And actually, really interestingly, I went on Monday to the funeral of a friend and he was, he had a long illness. He was in his early 70s. My husband and I were really honoured to be invited to help him and his wife plan the funeral ceremony when he heard that his illness, he wasn't going to be cured. And so 18 months ago, we'd sat and we talked about the kind of material things, because obviously this conversation really is about material, isn't it? Whether it's satin or fishing rods. And he said that he wanted to be cremated in something comfortable that would be something that he would have been comfortable wearing forever. He'd been working on farms all his life and he said that he hated cut flowers because they made him feel sad. So what he asked for was a wreath made of vegetables only and no flowers to be cut for him. And on the coffin was his fly fishing rod, which actually I was there at a conversation where his grandson was asking if that fishing rod could be cremated with him and of course it couldn't because what was left was bits of metal and bits of nylon and that wouldn't have been very easy to have removed so it, instead it was placed on top but I think in all of these things you're right it is very much what remains and how can fabric and other things but how can fabrics make something elevate it to a different level some of this is just plain utilitarian a, a body can be clothed. We wear clothing in life. We wear clothing at death. you got to have the fabric because it's just a life thing that's ubiquitous. In 1666 in England, there was a rule made that people could be buried only in wool. That means that they couldn't be buried in anything but wool. It wasn't like they had to have a woolen shroud and then they could be buried in their favorite clothes. No satin involved. They had to be naked in their shroud. And that was by law for a very long time. And the penalty for that was five pounds, which was a huge amount for an agricultural labourer. That would be two months work. And sometimes people were paid two pounds fifty to report on you 
for not having been buried or your family for not having been buried in wool. But the way that they do it, if they had some kind of money and they wanted to be buried in the things that had been important, what they did is one member of the family would report on the others. So then they would get back £2.50. So the net payment punishment for doing so was £2.50. But it, it seems so strange, doesn't it? It seems very wrong that you shouldn't be able to go in your own clothes. Somehow going naked to the next life seems more painful than going clothed, which is quite an interesting subject. The idea of moving from life to death and the old mythologies, if you can go back to ancient Greece, for example, I, I remember hearing about the spinning of the yarn or the or the string and then somebody snips it off. It's all very metaphorical, but... The idea of continuity, of, of having that fabric clothe us from here to there, is there an aspect of continuity that we're looking for there? While I was researching for my book, Fabric, I looked at the fates, the three fates of Greek mythology, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. And Clotho was in Roman mythology called Nona, which means the ninth month. So in a way, Clotho came in just before you were born. Lachesis decima, the 10th month when you are born, and Atropos simply morta, death. But the idea was that one of them spun the, the thread, one of them measured the thread, and Atropos morta, death, she cut the thread. But then I found out that the Vikings had had also three old women who they called the Norns. And it sounds like they should be the same. They all have a relationship with thread. But the Norns are called Urd, Vedandi and Skuld, which is what has been, what is now and what will be. And they do something different. They all sit under their ash tree, which is the sacred tree at the centre of the universe, and they spin. And one of them is kind of representing the fibre that's destined to be thread. One is representing the fibre that is thread and is being made into thread. So it's the kind of the ongoing, our ongoing identity. And the last one, she's not about cutting the thread. She's the spun thread, which is ready for the next stage. Some of those three, the second three, the Viking three, just seem to be so much more optimistic about how the way we are in the world, we just go into different stages. There's the birth of the thread. There's the spinning of the thread, the actual process. We're spinning right now. So we were born, now we're spinning. And in the future, we will die. Will we be cut or will we just be going to the next stage? I mean, I guess that's what faith communities are among the people who are struggling and questioning and reflecting on that important question. And for me, one of the reasons that I was excited about fabric, it seems to be a very good metaphor for that absolutely key question that we ask, which is, how do we live and how do we die? There's nothing cut. We're just at the next stage. Well, we moderns don't necessarily adhere, uh, you, you know, re religiously to the old mythologies. And yet, these these fabrics, these fibers that adorn funerary rites, when I think of all the funerals I've been to, the very first fabric I ever see when I attend a funeral walking in uh, to the building is going to be either some kind of lace on a tablecloth or a doily. And this is just for the guest book when I'm arriving to sign my name. You know, the fabric is there right from the get-go. And I haven't even mentioned what I would be wearing myself. And I was going to say, in a way, your fabric experience of a funeral, one's fabric experience of a funeral, starts in the morning when you, when you think, what will I wear today? And obviously different communities have different traditions. Um, and they have different traditions at different times. I mean... My first book was called Colour, and I was looking at different colours that were worn in mourning. I was remembering when I was in my early 20s and I went to live in Hong Kong, and I went over to one of the islands, and it was quite exciting. I was newly arrived. I had my camera, and I saw these people, and they looked absolutely wonderful. They were all dressed in white, and there were flowers, and they were chanting. Anyway, I took photographs, and had I realised that it was a funeral and that white was a funeral colour in Hong Kong and in China. Um, obviously, I wouldn't have done that. So it was quite interesting that I didn't get 
as somebody who hadn't been in Hong Kong or China before, I didn't get the signals, the visual signals that that was a funeral. In Persia, they used to, in ancient Persia, they used to wear clothes that were the colours of fallen leaves, obvious symbolism. In Brittany, the widows used to wear yellow. I don't quite know why. And there was one tradition in Armenia where people who were in mourning, in heavy mourning, wore sky blue to symbolise where they believed the deceased was now living. You mentioned the word signal. You said, I didn't get the signals. This is really fascinating to me, the idea that our rites of mourning, including the colors of what we wear, conspicuously put on display that we're in a, a different kind of a state, that, that our lives have changed radically, and, and that has a social function, I guess. It was curious for me. I mean, I've, I've written three books. I didn't want to go on about my books, but the first one was colour, and one of the questions I asked was, what colours do we wear during the key points of our lives? And mourning is one of them. Another one was jewels, and in different points, jet, the very, very black stone from a fossilised tree, that was very popular for mourning clothes in the 19th century, and then now in fabric. As I wrote the first two, I didn't understand it. I mean, I did understand that there were signals, but I didn't understand it. Then for my third book, I started writing it after my parents both died within three months. My father was expected and my mother was utterly unexpected. And particularly for my mother, I was very shocked and I went into deep grieving. And for the first time then, and I was lucky to be the age I was when I realised it, I realised what mourning clothes could be. They weren't some kind of formality they were a way. I wanted some. I wanted a way of people knowing. I didn't want them to be feel sorry for me, but I wanted them to know that I wasn't actually very capable. I was in that kind of madness that you can have when you're grieving. And I think that there is something really important. I don't know what it could be, an armband or something like that, just to say, don't trust me. I'm vulnerable right now. Don't trust me to do what you ask me to do, but also be tender in the contemporary world. We have so many choices that we can make. I mean, we can decide whether to wear mourning, we can decide whether to say that the person wanted us to be wearing bright clothes. You know, the the society doesn't make the rules about many things so much anymore. So it's down to us as individuals, in a way, to make those decisions, which can be liberating, but it can also be confusing. And I would imagine that's the case more so in individualistic societies, whereas more traditional communal societies are going to retain some of those shared uh, symbols, those those shared signals. You have written of being in certain places in Polynesia, for example. Uh, you mentioned Hong Kong, but uh, but let's go to Polynesia and and talk about the the near sanctity of, of fabrics among peoples, the, the bark cloth is fascinating to me, the way it's made and its station within their social and cultural um, context. Bark cloth is vital throughout Polynesia, throughout, throughout the Pacific. And I heard various extraordinary and read extraordinary accounts from the 18th century, 19th century about the use of bark cloth ritually in Tahiti. I'm going to say what bark cloth is because I didn't really know and I studied anthropology. I'd seen it in museums, but I didn't really know what it was. It, it does sound, if you don't know, quite itchy and quite unappealing. It sounds like, why would you wear something that was scratchy made of bark? But it's actually bark cloth is made from the inner bark. So there's the outer bark, which is the crusty thing that we all know. And then there is the inner bark, which is the bit between the outer bark and the core. The core is just a piece of old wood that's made up of last year's growth. And the inner bark is where the lifeblood of the tree, where the sap rises to feed everything that needs feeding in the tree. So it's like the bit of the tree that's most alive. And when it's, the, the, the bark cloth is made from a paper mulberry tree. They grow it for about 18 months, two years, 18 months for a loincloth and two years for a skirt. And they cut it, uh, they separate out the core, they take off the, the bark and then they bash it and they bash it and they bash it. And my goodness, the sound of it, it's one of the first sounds of the morning. 
in the Mycin, in the Papua New Guinean village where I stayed to learn how it was made. And it sounds like, I don't know whether I can do it on this table, bang, 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 but it's rhythmic and it's there and it's and it's it's almost like a chorus that starts in one house and then it's it's joined in another and they're all it's like a music of the village and it's a kind of white sort of light tanned color uh, when it comes out but then it's painted and it's painted the patterns that it's painted in matter sometimes they paint it free flow smooth lines colored in with red which are beautiful and from their imagination and then sometimes and sometimes that is for the critical points which is the rituals of feasting often for uh, br- introducing new children into the world or the ritual of death or the ritual of the widow or the widower after their mourning being welcomed back into the village. So those are the sort of the some of the key moments and they will paint with ancestral signs on the bark cloth with a black paint, a black paint that is really smelly. It's made from two vines and they're left for a week. And by the time they're painting it, it is extraordinary. It smells like um, silage. It smells like kind of if if you'd had kind of grass that had been allowed to rot, it smells just like that. The way you describe it, it sounds like you have an intimate acquaintance with the whole process. Am I wrong that you actually were taught how to do this? I was. I was. It was such a treat. I'd arranged with a village. It was very hard to find a village that makes bark cloth still in a contemporary way, in in a way that is useful for them rather than making it simply for the tourist market. And there were a few, but it was hard to find an invitation to them. And finally, the mycin of Papua New Guinea, Collingwood Bay, they live in a most astonishing, it's most beautiful place. It's coconut trees and sandy beaches and a beautiful cove. They were keen to have me and my friend, a photographer, to go there and tell their story because It's by selling bark cloth that they could survive. They set up a demonstration in the village. The village is a simple village, but it's very beautiful and very clean. And each house is made of black palm and it's made by the community. So the community will make the house for one person and then that person will contribute to make the house for another person. So there's very much community spirit. So we sat in the plaza and it was sunny. And each of the five clans had decided that they would tell us that they would show the process. And they dressed up in ritual clothes, which was amazing, which was kind of shells. And they had these beautiful feathers in each clan had different rights to wear the feathers of, say, the cassowary or different patterns. And so they had rights to patterns, to fabrics, to feathers. And they showed us and then they showed us the process of splitting down with a big bush knife, splitting down the bark, opening it up and then bashing it like um, pastry. And then once it had was um, was the length of a loincloth or the width of a loincloth or a skirt, then they would hold it up, dry it. Where there had been branches, there would be maybe little holes. So they mended it with little berries that were called glueberries. But in, in Australia, they were called snotty gobbles because they're really sticky. And you'd put little, little bits of spare buck cloth on it. And then you'd hang it. And then you'd paint it. And then you'd paint it red. And each phase had a moment of being celebrated and obviously it was an extraordinary thing to see they'd never done it before they did it for us but they didn't hadn't done it before for anybody and at the end Jessit who was one of our new friends in the village she said she said to us thank you she said because we learned something as women in the village and our children learned something as well. We won't forget these things that we learned today. So it was, yeah, there was a sense of kindness, but it was also an astonishing process that, to put it into context, these saplings were taken from Southeast Asia at some point that could be 60,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, but a lot of thousand years ago. And they would have been taken on small boats by people who settled on different islands. And the technology was passed on. Victoria Finley, she's author of Fabric, The Hidden History of the Material World. I'm Marcus Smith, and you're listening to Constant Wonder. Mm-hmm. 
So many fabrics can be comforting to us, and yet there are intentionally uncomfortable fabrics. I'd like to have a word from you about sackcloth, the idea of, uh, you know, a hair shirt or or some some kind of penitent behavior by wearing something very uncomfortable, I would imagine. I've never worn it. <laughs> I, I think it's always interesting in, in any context, with any metaphor, really, to look at the the things that we see the whole time and don't see, and I think sackcloth is one of them, or the sackcloth that was in the fields in the 1930s and 1940s in America, that was jute, but and now it's polypropylene. But nevertheless, these are things that contain and they cover and they hide. And sack, sack comes from a Hebrew word meaning goat's hair, specifically the hair of a harsh-haired goat, the belly hair of this goat, that was was very coarse. And so when you wore sack in traditional times, it was actually goat's hair, and it only later came to be made of, of rough flax or rough hemp or jute from India. Well, Jacob wore sackcloth when he thought that his son Joseph had been killed by wild animals. Um, there's a really moving story in the Bible in Kings 2 when the king of Samaria, there's a, there's a battle roaring outside and he's walking along the battlements. He meets a woman who, who's, well, who's more than distraught. Her baby has been eaten because there, there's so much famine and she's distraught. And he tears his cloth beneath them. The people see that he's wearing sackcloth and that's significant in Christianity. It's been almost a traditional signal and symbol of sainthood, that Thomas Becket was murdered by four knights in the 12th century in Canterbury. And the four knights, who thought that they were doing the king's will, went to his living quarters to sack it, and using another word for sack, to take what they could. They opened up a chest that they thought would be full of treasure, and there they found the sackcloth, the hair garments that he was accustomed to wearing. And they knew they had made a terrible mistake. They knew that they hadn't killed a man who was interested in money. They knew that they had killed a good man. And when the monks undressed his dead body, they again, they found that underneath his noble archbishop's robes made of silk, there was something much simpler made of linen or wool, like an ordinary monk, and beneath that, there were clothes made of sack, made of the hair of goats. I saw one, um, Thomas Thomas More, so we're talking um, much later, 16th century. He was about to be executed by Henry VIII. And so he spent his last few weeks in the tower and he wore a hair shirt that he'd worn when he was a young man, when he'd been thinking of going into the church. And he wore that. And in a way... I, I don't know, I, I thought about it a lot, and I haven't worn a hair shirt either, but I do remember wearing uncomfortable clothes when I was a child, wool, wool that scratched and things like that. And there's something, something that takes you over with that, but also it's really simple. It's a really simple pain. It's just scratchy and itchy. It's just the body, whereas the pain it's helping you control or come to terms with or look at or reflect on, that's the kind of deep, deep pain that is much harder to bear than just something scratchy, if, even if it really is very, very scratchy or painful or blood-making on your skin. I think we're out of touch in modern times with the idea that fabric can be so instructive. <laughs> I think we are, but I think that we know it as well. There's a sense that fabric can give clues. We often superficialize it, don't we? And we say, or oh, we think that it's people wearing kind of wonderful kind of designer clothes and things like that. And sometimes those are signals of, of something at least. But I think we know it when we see it. I mean, you knew 40 years ago when you saw that boy in the, his open coffin, you knew that the satin was doing something. You didn't need to be told. It didn't need to be part of your tradition. You knew it. And I think that we do know it. I think we do know that that we can do something with fabric. <laughs> it's superficial in that it's surface. It's two-dimensional, but it's got a third dimension. And we know that we can look at that if we decide to. If the fates or these Viking norns were spinning uh, some kind of thread that wasn't to be cut off, 
you know, we've got that nowadays, uh, threads that'll stick around forever. We're t- I'm talking about the synthetic fibers, and they- they're not going to decompose in a grave anytime soon. There is a sense that plastic clothes, and that really is clothes made of oil, nylons, polyesters, and similar lycra, other things that are made of oil, they don't get eaten by clothes moths. Nothing really will fret them, to use a biblical word. We've got a problem. We have got this massive problem. It's not just nylon clothes, polyester clothes. It's also the amount, the quantity of clothes that we make. But if you were to be buried in polyester, yeah, it would outlive you. It would out, It would outstay you. Your bones would be dust before the polyester disappeared. The, I, I saw the other day somebody had put a T-shirt just for interest into their compost at the bottom. And a year later, they pulled it out and it was just the clothes tags, you know, the, the washing tags that were left. And there was something really comforting in that. I was given an analogy for this and it was with a friend who had cancer. She has two sons at the time. One of the sons was 12 and she couldn't work out how to tell them, you know, how could she word it? It She didn't know what her prognosis was at the time. It was a secondary. So we went to see a friend of hers who's professionally working in hospitals, giving that kind of advice. And the friend said, do you know what cancer is? And actually, we looked at each other and we realised that on one level, we didn't know what cancer was. She said, the natural life of a cell, like an idea, (laughs) is that it arises, it's born, it lives and it dies. And cancer is the cell that doesn't die. And that's the problem. It's not doing what it should do in time. And I'm not, I mean, actually, you know, nylons, polyesters, they have their uses. And one of the big problems really is not just the making, but it's actually the disposing, but they don't die. So we really do have to be extremely careful about disposing of them. You talk about the seamless robe in one account of, of, I guess, in the the Gospel of John. And we're talking about uh, Jesus Christ and his raiment uh, after his crucifixion. Uh, Why would you be so interested in the fabric in that story? And what is that story? It's a very good question. The seamless robe only is mentioned in the book of John, in the Gospel written by, by John. And it is a robe without seams, and translated as being woven from above, and it was divided by the soldiers as Christ died. And it was mentioned at the absolute point at which Christ was reported to have died. So a lot was going on in that moment. I don't know why. I didn't know why. I couldn't imagine why John would have really mentioned the fact that the robe was made without seams. And what did that mean? You know, that means unsewn. In fact, the word in Greek is without needle. I asked that question of a lot of people and a lot of books. And when I found that it was an almost impossible piece of clothing to make. Somebody in the 17th century invented a loom that would make it because you've got to you've got to sew it like a sock really right round and then you to make the sleeves you've got to sort of flip it over and then make the sleeves like the warp so upside down to make the sleeves but you've got to walk around that huge loom which is as big as a person bigger than a person you've got to walk around each time i mean it's an astonishingly complicated item if you're actually going to make it but even if you could make it even if it's not an impossible garment why would he have been wearing it it would have been a very expensive garment to make for its ridiculousness so why would he have been wearing it this extraordinary barefoot teacher who promoted simplicity and um, why would john have mentioned it anyway and not the others is it safe for me to say that the manufacture and then the wearing of this garment uh, was so extraordinary that fabric elevated the wearer in the, in, in the eyes of others So what I think happened is that he didn't wear a clothing like that. He didn't wear it because it was metaphorical. And it was metaphorical because if it was woven from above, 
then it was as if the power had come from above. So each of those elements was metaphorical, but also, and I'm really doing the spoiler alert here, we mentioned the fates before, and the fates were Greek, ancient Greek, but also they were Greek. They were the ancient classical world of pagan gods, and they were what were being left behind by this new faith, which was called Christianity. And so, in a way, what we're saying is, in this metaphorical clothing, not actual clothing that Christ was wearing as he went onto the cross or just as he he was wearing before, he was on the cross. It is perhaps saying that this is a moment in the history of the world where the thread of atropos, of mortar, is not cut. It is unsewn. There is nothing to be cut. This is the one life that will go on and on because of who this great leader was. And so the theme ties in in some way with the continuity I was asking you about, the idea of, uh, yeah, there's you won't find a boundary here. You'll find uh, uh, spinning on into the future eternally. Yeah, that's absolutely. And I think, you know, fabric, it's funny because it's, it's effectively, it feels like a two-dimensional thing. If there's a third dimension in most fabrics, it's really, really thin. And yet, when we look at very simply at things that are covered, at things that are uncovered, things that are seen, things that are unseen, one, it actually gives us clothes. Two, I think it gives us a sort of way of looking at how we can move, as you said, from one side of the boundary to the next. Victoria Finley is author of Fabric, The Hidden History of the Material World. I'm Marcus Smith. Next week, you can expect more of our regular fare here on Constant Wonder. We're going to set out with Joseph Mikulik on his nearly three-decade-long journey around the globe on foot. Just what was in that massive book he carried from country to country? Thanks for listening. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Marcus Smith for Constant Wonder. That last conversation ties in beautifully with a gem from our archives. In the excerpt you're about to hear, author Cassius Sinclair takes us from woolen Viking sails to spacesuits made by Playtex. I would suppose that in modern times, when you say the word linen, people know what linen is in its final form, but, and they may even know it comes from flax, but the process is really quite a mystery to most of us, isn't it? I think this is it. I think it was really astonishing, even to me. You know, I, I started out the book because I had a, a fascination with 18th century um, textiles, and that, you know, led me to, to want to find out more. And when I was looking back at these, you know, the really earliest examples, I, su- I suppose I expected to find um, that wool would be really heavily represented because, you know, sheep, you know, even the sort of early ancestors of sheep that were a little bit less woolly than their modern sort of contemporary sheep today, you know, even then they still kind of flaunt their fibre. You know, it's right there. If a, if a sheep rubs up against a tree, it kind of leaves a little tuft behind. And yet linen and, and flax fibres, you know, are far and away the earliest examples of, of textiles that we can find, which is ex- extraordinary when you learn about how, you know, the steps that it takes to get from a flax plant to linen. So firstly, flax, you know, it, it, it's now um, farmed, but originally, of course, it grew wild. So, you know, the first step of, of getting a, a linen um, piece of fabric would be to find um, flax plants that were growing and it was it were at the right stage of their development if they're too young the fibers that you get from them will be too fine and and won't really hold together they'll be a bit mushy but if you leave it too long and the flax plant is too old then you get really tough fibers which can be great for creating say net 
or or you know sacking something like that, but not perhaps what you want against your skin. So you have to find plenty of, of wild linen that's at just the right stage of development. You then pluck this up from the roots and um, take it back in order to begin the, the processing. And this involves rotting away the kind of fibrous outer layers of um, the, the plant stem and also kind of the, the stiff inner core bits. And what you're left with are some very long fibers that make up part of the innermost core of the plant. And they're kind of almost pearlescent. They're sort of very long and Strong. And then these have to be joined together end to end in order to make a, a thread that can then be worked with. And the process of, of rotting away the outer fibre and then detaching all the other parts of the stem was, you know, it, it's still quite long and complicated. And when you look at the tools and the methods that were being used, and, and you know, from what we know about the, the tools and methods that were being used in, for example, ancient Egypt, it was um, a process that would have taken many days and involved some, you know, really uncomfortable manual labor and, and a lot of patience as well. You have mentioned wool already, but I am astonished by what you have described as, again, a very labor-intensive process for making all kinds of fabrics way up north in Scandinavia, but among these materials, the sails for their long ships. This is something that completely astonished me when I found out about it. When you think, of, I mean, I'm not much of a, a sailor, although my husband is, but when you think about the kind of you know, material or textile that you would want for a sail, I think you know, woven wool is possibly one of the last textiles that you might imagine. I, I mean, from um, my own experience, hand washing a woolen jumper, for example, you know that um, wool absorbs quite a lot of fabric. And, you know, it's, it, it's wonderful for keeping us warm because it's full of holes that, you know, that's, that's not something that you want in a sailcloth because it, it makes it very inefficient. And yet, the Vikings were able to use wool to make sails that were really pretty efficient. I've actually spoken to an archaeologist who um, was able to sail in a boat that had replica, the replica Viking ship, and it had replica um, sails that were, were made with these sort of special techniques. And she is a sailor, and she said that actually the the way in which you were able to to sail was was really quite incredible. They were very efficient. Um, as she said, the only thing that she really noticed was that there was a pronounced smell of kind of wet jumper while she was sailing <laughs> in this in this replica ship, which I really loved. But you know, we we actually we're, we're very lucky to know a fair amount about the special techniques that were used to process this wool because. Several decades ago, a church in you know the very northern part of, of Norway, the roof was being repaired. And while the builders were up there, they found um, between several joists that there were these kind of tough bits of what they initially thought were leather, but on closer inspection turned out to be woolen cloth. And these pieces of cloth were actually the remnants of a sail that had been sort of produced in the local town and then had been stored in the church in case of emergency. So the idea was that if there was a raid or if there was a war, the everyone knew where the sails were and you could go and, and collect them very quickly. But these leftover bits of cloth that were kind of you know, at some stage taken up and used to kind of plug gaps in the roof were, you know, a really wonderful source of information in how um, wool was used by these incredibly skilled people in order to make very efficient sales. So to go back to the, the very beginning, the sheep, these sheep are not like our, our sort of modern sheep. They were sort of um, very hardy lived completely, you know, without human intervention for, for most of the year. And the only time they'd sort of really see people is when the people came to collect the wool. This would be done by hand, a process called ruing, where essentially you're sort of plucking the wool by hand, the wool that sheep are naturally shedding. 
this is quite labour intensive and the sheep are sort of semi wild. So it must have been quite a big day out for the Viking, uh, for the Viking families that were collecting the wool. And then this wool would be a sort of tough, wiry outer coat that these sheep would have had. And then a finer, fluffier inner coat. Um, these would need to be sorted from each other and then they'd be put in bags with a bit of oil, probably fish oil, to help soften up the fibres. And this would, you know, these bags would probably be forgotten about for several months until um, it was winter time, at which point the family would sort of, you know, have less farming to do and there would be more time on hand to do kind of indoor work of which processing wool was a big part of that. So the wool would be nicely softened with all these kind of rich fatty oils from fish, probably a bit smelly. But then there would come the process of the weaving and actually the manufacture of sails. The tough outer fibres were very good for making the warp, the kind of initial um, longitudinal fibres. And then the fluffier fibres from the, the inner coat of the sheep would be used to create the weft. The reason being is that you sort of want a, a kind of a rigid, a strong fabric and the wiry outer wool gives you that. But the softer wool, because it is softer, because it's fluffier, is kind of used to help plug the gap between the warp fibres and to make the textile more windproof. Again, to kind of help plug up holes, the finished textile would be treated with a, a mixture of of fats and probably sort of animal fats um, like lard and also ochre. And this final treatment, you know, after the, the cloth had been processed and, and fulled to, to help fluff the fibres together, this final layer helped almost completely seal the little natural holes that you get in any woven woolen fabric. And then finally, it's really you know, a pretty good textile in order to, to, to be used as a sail. And the Vikings, of course, as we all know, they, they were consummate sailors. They were able to travel vast distances using these incredible and very sophisticated textiles. They were incredibly labor intensive. The sales, you know, the estimates that we have or that people have, have, have worked on indicate that the sales were far more labor intensive than the ships themselves. You know, the ships might be ready in a matter of weeks. The sales could be the, the product of several years of work and and they were incredibly valuable. That's why they were kept at kind of central locations. And also, you know, this would be predominantly the work of women, although, you know, there's indication that it was sort of, you know, very much a family activity, but a lot of the skilled weaving, uh, you know, that would have been done by women. And so this was very valuable labor. This was, you know, vital to society and to culture. And you have to presume that some women would have been particularly good at, at part of the process or that women who who had a reputation as very good sail makers, it would have given them a really good status within the community. You do take us all the way up to modern times and you spend a fair amount of time describing space suits. Tell us a little bit about that from the Apollo space suits to what's being made today because those processes, while not quite as labor intensive, they're still a matter of finesse and exactness. You know, it's, it's actually a, a very nice leap to go from Vikings making um, uh. <laughs> their woolen sails in order to explore, it, and then you know, look at, at the at the kind of the modern, uh, you know, the, the sort of modern equivalent, which is the effort to get human beings into space, and particularly on the surface of the moon. And in order to do that, you need kind of a one man or woman space covering that will enable the human body to survive in an environment that is incredibly hostile, that, that the human body simply wasn't designed to exist in. And in order to create such a suit, people have to turn to textiles. You know, predominantly, you know, the vast majority of, of the Apollo 11 spacesuits were not made with natural fibers. They were made with man-made synthetic fibers that would be able to withstand intense cold, intense heat that were very fire safe. Because another thing you've got to remember about space is that spacecraft are, are very oxygen-rich environments. That makes 
you know, that makes them fire hazards. And even the textiles that today that firemen and women wear on the on the Earth's surface today just simply um, wouldn't be fire safe enough in the oxygen rich environment that you, that you have in space. And these, the Apollo 11 spacesuits would be made on, you know, with layer upon layer of different textiles that would serve different needs. One might help reflect heat, one might be particularly good insulator because you've got to imagine, you've got to remember that you can, in the shade uh, in space, it's incredibly cold. But if you suddenly go into a patch of, of sunlight, it can be really very hot. And you've also got to survive G-forces. You've got to survive the vacuum of space. And so these took an awful lot of, of planning. And, you know, this was sort of a, a very important thing that NASA had to do. They had to create these suits. And so the process for finding a firm that was capable of manufacturing such a piece of technology, you know, this, they went through a very extravagant tender process. And actually, the firm that they found to create the Apollo 11 spacesuits astonished everyone, none more so than NASA themselves, who were slightly horrified, um, because the firm that they found were, could, who could best create a spacesuit were Playtex, who were makers of, of women's underwear at the time. And they were sort of very hesitant to get them on board and to, to have them as, as their makers of the Apollo 11 spacesuit, because it seemed like it rather undermined this whole idea of the heroic man going into space <laughs> when you learn that actually the people making it are also making women's girdles and, and pantyhose. But, but there we go, that the women who were working on the production line for Playtex, and very often it would be the same women who were making girdles or who were making diapers would be pulled off those production lines and, and sent to work on the Apollo 11 suits. But they had real expertise, both with these kind of new modern synthetics that were being used a lot in women's underwear. And there was actually quite a lot of, of crossover. So, for example, when in some of the early test suits that were being tried out by the astronauts, the Apollo 11 astronauts, there was found to be a real problem with chafing because, you know, there are a lot of complex movements involved. These suits are very cumbersome. You spend long hours in them and, and they can get very uncomfortable. And so, you know, when this feedback was sort of sent back to Playtex, they thought, well, you know, we know exactly what to do. Women have complained about the same thing with their girdles. And so the exact same sort of soft, fluffy liner that was used in women's girdles was repurposed and put into the Apollo 11 spacesuits. And also the, the fine nylon mesh that was used in women's bras was used to kind of anchor the latex layer of the Apollo 11 suits in order to stop latex from ballooning and becoming unmanageable and, and too stiff so that the astronauts wouldn't be able to move. Now, I understand one of the basic uh, underpinning concepts of your book is that fabric changed history. I kind of wonder if change is too, um, too timid a word. Uh, it seems that fabric has driven history, that it's been, it has fueled history, that it's been of vital importance all the way through. And I, I'm sure you agree with me here. Uh, I, I'm wondering if in the histories that are written of the, the passage of you know, the human generations, if the the slight is is really not there, if it's if we've if it's kind of the orphan child of all history stories, I th yeah, I think it's a real shame, and I and I think what I found so surprising is you know I embarked on this book project before the Secret Lives of Color even came out, even in the UK. You know, I, I was already excited about this idea; I'd already pitched for it, and I already had the, the contract, and. I would be talking to friends or I would be talking to colleagues and they would say, oh, what are you working on now? You know, now that you've written The Secret Lives of Colour, what's next? And I would say, I'm, I'm working on a book about textiles and, and the cultural history of textiles. And I'd watch their faces just fall. And there was this expression <laughs> in their eyes that was kind of, you know, almost like a switching off, like this subject isn't for me. And, you know, a, a bit of a, you know, what a shame that she's chosen to write about textiles. Ugh. Um, but I think something that really infused my research and then the writing of the book was my, my feeling that this was a real shame and my own frustration with this, exactly what you say, this, this view that, that textiles sort of aren't important when, you know, they, they are important. They are really vital to our history. They can tell us so much about who we are. 
and, 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 and previous cultures, you know, trade, decoration, personal identity, status, all these things are, are, can be really bound up with, with textiles. And they are still very important to us now. You know, we wake up in them, we wear them against our skin. You know, textiles, we use them intimately every single day. They're there with us every single day of our lives. And they've also fueled economies. Um, how can how can we treat this as something that's unimportant? And I and I think this this feeling, this emotion that I saw in people's eyes when I talked about my my new project, you know, this kind of like, oh, this isn't important, this isn't for me. I really wanted to counter that and I wanted to tell stories that I thought would fascinate everyone and that would give a lie would to this view that textiles are unimportant. I wanted to make to choose stories that were as vital and as compelling as possible in order to persuade people that textiles are, are really worth our attention and our notice. Last of all, Cassie, I want to just uh, discuss one little nuanced aspect with you of all of this, which is you kind of indicate that people get excited about fabrics once they have the final product in hand, once you can talk about uh, the fashion, uh, the, uh, the, the end product, maybe it's the spacesuit, whatever it is. But there's a kind of appeal, there's a kind of fascination you seem to have just with the raw materials themselves before something is fashioned into a purse or a jacket or a pair of pants that, that you like to just think about the, the fibers, the, the raw materials. Absolutely. I think they're so inherent with possibility. And when you look at the textiles, the, the finished product, they are such a, an indication of human creativity. Humans have been able to take fibers, often natural fibers, with all their inherent weaknesses and, and flaws and create wonderful things through human ingenuity, through human labor, through, you know, just an application of who we are as a species. And I think that is something that is really joyful. And the, the history of, of textiles, you know, even in this book, which is you know, very much a, a potted history, the, the history of textiles has so many dark corners. And yet I can't help but absolutely love textiles for that sense of possibility and for the relationship that they have with us. They seem to allow, textiles seem to allow human beings to show off both their best side, their creativity, their boundless enthusiasm and capacity to create, and, and also some of the, the worst sides of human life as well. Cassia Sinclair, such a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Cassia Sinclair is author of The Golden Thread, How Fabric Changed History, and The Secret Lives of Color. I'm Marcus Smith. Thanks for joining us this hour for Constant Wonder. Our podcast is a production of BYU Radio.